Hello, this is Dr. Gomez from the University of Texas South San Antonio, and today we're going to talk about bone biopsies. And this presentation is going to be a combination of videos and slides uh, with general tips about doing bone biopsies, more tailored to people who are starting to do this type of biopsies and want to have a general understanding of uh, what a biopsy is all about and what you should do uh, from preparing the patient to actually doing the biopsies. And of course, we'll give some examples. So if, before we move to talk about biopsies and tips, we're going to talk briefly about indications. So biopsies are usually indicated for osseous lesions, primary or secondary. Uh, most of the time we get uh, metastatic lesions because they're most common, but also for primary lesions such as osteosarcoma. One thing you need to remember is that when you get a request for a primary uh, lesion of the bone or a lesion that you think could be primary, it's good practice to first uh, refer to the orthopedic oncologist. Uh, obviously, if the patient is referred by the orthopedic oncologist, then in that case, talk to him or her and ask them how they how you want to get the biopsy done because sometimes they want to protect some flaps they're going to use later and they may suggest uh, and and how you're going to approach this lesion so when you get a biopsy request for a lesion that you think it would be primary uh, get a hold or 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 recommend to be consulted to orthopedic oncology we also do biopsies for infection anywhere in the body from the lung bones uh, to the axial skeleton in the spine, this guy is osteomyelitis. Uh, some people feel that this is debatable because maybe 75 to 80 percent of the samples grow an organism in a good day. And usually when the patient has been in chronic IV antibiotic treatment, usually the bone sample doesn't grow anything. But it is still the infectious disease gold standard to do bone biopsy for a culture. And also we use it for uh, as a way of accessing image guided therapy like osteoosteoma uh, or lesion, metastatic lesion for palliative treatment. We can do radiofrequency ablation or cryoablation. We don't do microwave ablation for the bone, uh, but we commonly do radiofrequency, which is burning a lesion and cryoablation, which is freezing the lesion. The topics we're going to discuss in this presentation are general considerations and how to use two of the common bone biopsy systems, which is the bone opti and the bone control. Uh, those are the ones that I use the most. I also use the osteocyte needle, but bone opti and bone control are the ones that I personally use the most. There are a lot of needles, but those are the ones I'm going to discuss and they have similar mechanisms. Then some tips for spinal lesion, uh, tips for lytic lesions, tips for the sclerotic lesions, and uh, some tips uh, for bone marrow aspiration. So it's good to remember that the biopsy systems, there are a lot of them, but there are two main uh, mechanisms of doing biopsies. And the first one is the mallet one, which you use a hammer, a mallet, to just pretty much hammer a needle in place uh, to do the biopsy. And the other way of doing it is needles that you turn around, have a diamond tip, and you pretty much serve as a screw and you screw the needle into the bone and through the lesion to get a biopsy. Most of these uh, needles are human powered, right? You have to use your hand or a turning motion or a handle and uh, on control, which is a battery powered drill. And that is turning uh, clockwise to get into the bone, just like a screwdriver would do. So two big uh, or major mechanical ways of doing it through the mallet and, um, and through the needles that you actually screw in the bone. A mallet is very commonly used for um, vertebroplasties and getting through the pedicles as the, a lot of the people who do that uh, prefer to use the mallet. Uh, most of the MSK radiologists use the needle that uh, that you ha have to screw in the bone. So these are the two uh, systems that we're going to discuss today. One is the on control, which is made by Teleflex, the parity power drill, and the other one will be the bone opti, which is the one that has the knob that you turn around and it's made by Apriomed. Again, there are other systems, but these are the ones that I kind of going to go through in my little video on tips on how to use it and what do you do from beginning to end. 
before we get to talk about the videos and the use of the needle, um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, the grid marking and the position of the patient. So how we do biopsies, we usually in the bone, we usually do them on CT guidance because you have two dimensions. And some situations you could do it on fluoroscopy. I don't do image guided biopsies of the bone and ultrasound because of course when the ultrasound beam hits the bone, um, it kind of gets completely absorbed and you don't see anything further. So you, it's hard to see the needle tip, but there are some people who do it. I just don't do it. I think it's safer to do it on CT, but some people don't have availability to it. So in CT, we put a grid, uh, which is something, this is by Apriomet, uh, that sticks to the skin. And there are many uh, vendors that sell them of different prices and it, you gotta find the ones that you like. And you put this in the patient's skin in the area that you're gonna go. And of course have these lines and these lines are, uh, this plastic is cover, uh, this plastic is covering small wires that will be very radio dense in the CT. So we do a scanning of the patient. Here's the lesion, the proximal humerus. And then what you do is that you kind of decide which of the lines you're going to go in. And you, you, you have to note the position of the table on the CT scan. And then you go in and you mark it. So, for example, if I want to go through here, then I'll put a mark here. And if that CT table positioning is 160, I go to the CT, place the positioning, place the patient in the 160 position, and then put a mark on the skin in this region. And that's how you mark where you're gonna go. Keep in consideration that once you scan the patient uh, and you're trying to figure out where you're gonna go, you should do it as fast as possible because if the patient moves, then the grid is not gonna work that much. So if the patient is in a lot of pain and he's jumping and moving the table, there'll be some difference between the scan and the positioning that you put for marking because the table positioning will be different if the patient's moving up and down uh, at, the, at, the, at the CT table. So keep that in mind. Another thing to remember is patient positioning. Obviously, I think that if you do biopsies a lot, you uh, kind of uh, learn that the best way to do biopsy is to go directly perpendicular into the, to the body perpendicular to the skin, like in this case. You have the skin and you have almost like a 90 degree because you don't have to play with angulations, right? You just have to go completely down and it's kind of easier to the eye. And this where we're going in the sacrum, the patient was uh, able to be completely prone and it was kind of an easy biopsy. But keep in mind that for many reasons, maybe by surgery or by because the patient doesn't tolerate positioning, sometimes you have to place the patient in awkward positions. So here we're going to this um, posterior iliac lesion would otherwise would be an easy shot. And this is the only way the patient was able to position himself in the CT. And we have to go kind of almost um, get on our knees to go from inferior to, uh, to superior and get into this lesion. So um, keep that in mind that sometimes the position of the patient is not optimal, but you should always try to be in a way that you're perpendicular to the skin because it will be easier for you and you don't have to play in your mind with angulations and such. But uh, we all see all kinds of patients and it's good to get used to try to uh, uh, work the angulation of the needle and uh, get used to being in uncomfortable places if you cannot place the patient in the desired position. So, hi, so we use different needles uh, for bone biopsies. Some of the needles use the mallet uh, technique which you hit with a hammer through the bone through the cortex of the bone marrow until you do the biopsy. Also, we do uh, we use needles that are kind of a twist, almost like a screw. And like if you were using a drill, when I we actually have a drill, uh, the on control. So I'm gonna describe how to use the two needles that I use the most, which is the Bone Opti by Apriomet and the on control, uh, which is uh, uh, by Teleflex. So. They pretty much have the same mechanism, but I'm gonna explain kind of both of them, how you use them if you're beginning to do bone biopsies. Um, but there are many other needles. I also use the osteocyte and I use the mallet needle when you're using the osteocool system from Medtronics. Uh, they're all very good needles, it depends on what you like. I like some needles for some biopsies, depending on how big is the bone, where is I'm going. If I want it to be precise or all that stuff uh, comes into consideration for me when I'm doing a biopsy. So 
The first one that I'm going to talk about here is the bone opti. It's a very uh, classic needle and it's the one that has the knob and you go through the bone turning the knob like if you're screwing a board. So uh, this ones that have the solid colors are kind of the older needles. They're still very useful. Uh, in fact, uh, this little needle is the one I use to do very small bones uh, like the metatarsal or phalanges when we're doing for infections or small tumors. And this is the newer uh, bone T needle. It has the two colors that uh, the knob is a little wider. So th some things to know about the bone T needle. Uh, first is that uh, it's, it's human power. So you have to turn the knob when you get to the cortex. Once you uh, know the exact place where you're going to be, once you eat the periosteum, you have to actually turn the knob to try to get into the cortex. And if the cortex and bone is really hard, it can be a lot of work. Now, do, they do sell an adapter. It's like a big knob that you turn it once and the needle turns three times. Also, I just, uh, the bone of is the only needle that I use that has a threaded needle, meaning that it will pull you in, right? But the threaded needle will help you break the cortex as opposed to the diamond tip that we're going to talk a little bit about it. Um, it helps you break the cortex, but it will pull you in. And any of these other needles won't go in unless you're putting force on it. So this is the bone opti and the other needle that I use is a lot is the uncontrolled. It's the one that has some electrical power drill. And this one comes in, let's say two flavors, it comes in different size, but uh, comes in the one that is the bone biopsy system that has a biopsy needle, uh, a coaxial needle, sorry, and a biopsy needle. And it also comes in the bone marrow aspiration needle, which only has the bone uh, needle because you're going into the bone and you don't need to get to a lesion. So once you're in the bone, you can aspirate and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the needles. So all bone biopsy needles obviously are hollow, hollow needles. That's where the bone is going to go. Uh, but because they're kind of flat in the top, they need a stylet or a needle that goes in the biopsy needle itself or coaxial that has a diamond tip and it's the one that is going to penetrate the cortex that we call a diamond tip It's not threaded uh, and this is the one that you anchor on the bone and you twist to try to get through the cortex obviously the consistency of the cortex is much harder than the medullary bone so the hardest part most of the time is to get through the cortex unless you're going to a sclerotic lesion so how all this needle works is that you get to the cortex with the coaxial, if you have a coaxial, and then you go through the bone. And after you go through the bone, you take the, the stylet out, and then you keep drilling with the empty needle, because obviously in the hollow part of the needle, that's where the bone is gonna go. Now, it's very characteristic of uh, the bone biopsy needles that they have to have a trapping mechanism, right? Because you're, you're drilling to the bone, but then when you take the needle back, there has to be some mechanism in place that will grab that bone and take it with you inside the needle. Because otherwise you go and drill the bone and you take the needle out and the bone stays in place. And most of this needle will have to, uh, some type of crown, uh, little T at the end of the needle and they're slightly inward. So when you kind of are drilling back, uh, it grabs that piece of bone and takes it out. So. This is pretty much the basis of all bone needles. Um, style it, the biopsy needle. Uh, and the coaxial, if you have a coaxial, if you have a coaxial, then you have the stylet or the diamond tip that goes through the cortex, the coaxial needle, and the biopsy needle that goes through the coaxial. So we use uh, the coaxial needle if, the, if there's a lesion within the bone and you have to go through some medullary uh, trabecular bone before getting there, you go with this coaxial needle and then once you're closer to, at the beginning of the lesion uh, you take the stylet out and then you go in with uh, the biopsy needle and then you take your sample. Obviously the biopsy needle is always longer than the coaxial because it has to go further. So things that are very particular for each needle I'm going to start with the uncontrol. The uncontrol one of the things that you have to remember and I it's really important is that it's powered this is the drill. The drill goes in a, in a plastic that the company provides that keeps its tear off. 
you just dress it up around uh, you open the the tray and the tech will put will actually put the biopsy gun uh, in the tray uh, so the, the, the biopsy gun comes like that and this will be all uh, covered by a plastic and she or he or she the tech will put the needle click it and then you dress it with the plastic and you have a functional drill so it's battery power it doesn't last forever in the back has like a little light so you should always make sure that the light is green uh, it turns yellow or orange and means that it's kind of dying and then red when it's completely dying and you should change it so before each procedure you should ask the test to the tech to show you that uh, that green um, the green light means that it's still very charged so very important this uncontrolled needle uh, the stylet has to be completely secured in in order to click in here if it's not it won't click you see you try and try in here and it's not clicking and often what you need to do is just make sure it's completely tight and then it clicks you need to hear the click and then you can drill uh, to take the needle out you uh, pull this back this retractable plastic and then the needle will come out so very important when you're barely anchoring a cortex it's really important for you that when you retract this and you want to get it out you hold the needle so it kind of stays in the bone because sometimes it's not really completely anchored but if you don't hold the needle and you pull you pull the plastic and you pull everything out the needle comes out of place so it's always good to hold the needle uh, so click it has to be tied in retract the plastic and you retract the needle uh, it's very simple another very important thing the, about the the uncontrol is that it doesn't have a threaded needle like the bone up tip it's only a diamond tip so this needle will, will only go forward or backwards if you push it and that's very important to remember because some people are very scared that once you start drilling it's going to go in and it won't i mean as long as you don't apply pressure it's not going to go anywhere that said the bones have different consistency and you may be full so if you're learning to do this the first thing you need to do is once you get to the bone you start drilling first without applying any forward motion at all and when you start drilling you try to judge the consistency of the bone you push a little bit and get a feeling of how hard or soft is the bone before you push but you never do this you never drill and push at the same time because you have to judge the consistency of the bone before you do that so that's a very important thing to remember and again if you have a coaxial uh, with the uh, uncontrolled yeah you go through the cortex right i have an example here uh, you go through you go through the cortex and you're getting the bone supposedly you check with your ct and you know where the lesion is you take it out you take this stylet out and you click again and then you take the sample and then you check where you are it's always a good idea to have evidence of where you have gone through and then uh, you completely take it out important for the monopty the company says that the best way to activate the trapping mechanism is once you go through the lesion and you check with the ct scan take some images and you have evidence that you're within the lesion it is best to activate the trapping mechanism if you start drilling and then do a slight forward movement and without stopping to drill, you take the needle out. So something like this, you start drilling, you push a little bit forward and then you completely take the needle out after you're completely out of the body. So that's the best way to activate the trapping mechanism with the bone opti. Once you're out, all the needles have a pusher. And it depends if it's the bone marrow aspiration, it will go from distal to proximal, but the bone biopsy signal goes from proximal to distal, and you go in and it pushes the needle out. One of the things that I do for the bone, when I'm trying to push the bone, sometimes it gets stuck in, in the needle, especially if the bone is hard, so I wouldn't do a biopsy more than two centimeters. And when I'm pushing, I'm putting in the tail and I put my hand, because you'll be surprised how many times you're trying to push the needle and suddenly you, you get it out and it flies out of the table. So it's a good practice to, when you're pushing the needle out, to put your hand to cover it just in case if the 
piece of bone flies away, you can catch it. So that's one thing you can do. And of, uh, also, remember, don't take a biopsies more than two centimeters because it may be really hard to get out of the needle. And it has happened to me before that I take a sample, especially sclerotic lesions, and then I can get it out of here. Uh, some people say that you can warm it up and that helps the needle uh, get out, but it doesn't really work that well, but there's some of the things that people say to do. Another thing with the, with the uncontrolled needle that you need to remember is that once you're in the bone and you're touching the bone, right? You're here touching the bone. A lot of the people wanna kind of hold the needle while you're drilling, but don't do that because I've seen a lot of times that when you drill and you're holding the needle, your glove gets stuck. You're holding like this, to trying to make it, uh, keep it straight, and you start drilling, and the glove gets stuck in the needle, and then it becomes a mess, right? Because this is an electrical, electrical power, and the, the glove gets torn, and you have to start all over again, and you know, of course you break the, uh, uh, the sterile field. So don't ever grab the needle when you're uh, trying to put it in. The only time that you should, or you could, is this one, once the coaxial needle is in and it's anchored and you stake the standard out, and then you're going in with the biopsy needle itself, obviously the coaxial needle is not gonna move. So in that sense, here you can hold the coaxial needle and then you can drill safely, hold it in. But if the needle is moving, just don't grab it because it will grab that glove. Trust me, it happens all the time. So those are the things to remember with the own control. Uh, remember, he will never move forward or backwards unless you push it. It doesn't have a threaded uh, tip, so it will never do that. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, bone opti. This is the old, um, the old needle for the bone opti and the coaxial needle and the biopsy needle. And people ask about what does what this does, and this is just to, uh, to measure. Uh, as you can see in the uncontrolled needle, the needle itself, I don't know if you can see, has some little lines. And that line is one centimeter each. So you know kind of going through the scheme how deep you're going. But with the bone opti, there are no lines. So when you're doing a biopsy, I mean, if you go in with the coaxial, um, this is the coaxial and you're already anchor on the bone. And each of these little uh Plastics measures half a centimeter and you can put it on top of the needle and if you go in uh, one centimeter where well, you clip it out and then you go in and it will only go in as as much as you clip it right so here will be uh, one two three four centimeters so uh, if, if you don't want to go that much you just measure it and see the difference in the length and this will give you a precise uh, uh, kind of movement of the needle. Uh, if you're not a person that wants to check all the time, you know, while you move. The bone opti system is great for small bones. I really like it. And also, as I discussed before, it does have a threaded needle. So even though it's really hard to move, right, you're, you're trying to move this with your thumbs, uh, but to try to break into the cortex, this threaded needle will help you a lot. Um, it is hard when you're in bone. Sometimes you go in and go in and nothing moves, but it is a very precise needle. It's the smallest needle that I use. And I, I find it quite useful to go through very small pedicles in the upper thoracic spine, to go to the metatarsal bones or phalanges of the hand that sometimes we do for infection. Um, because even though it may, be, it may not be true, I feel like I have more control of the needle because there's no, the movements that you do to move it are kind of very, uh, fine-tuning so it feels like you have more control and of course the needle is is not that big but the system is the same uh, as the uncontrol as any other needle you go with the coaxial needle you break through the bone so we have an, an example again you go through the bone and then once you're in the place that you want to be same thing you take the stylet out and then you go in with the biopsy needle and you take a sample of the bone, go in. Usually we go in, we turn, 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 turn. Uh, when I wanna uh, get back, I kind of move in both ways. And then as I turn, I try to get the, the needle out. Uh, so it gets very good samples as well. So these are the two needles that I use the most. 
So now that we watched the video, we're going to continue with some tips for biopsies of the bone. And the first tip we're going to talk about is uh, tips for uh, lesions in the spine. So lesions in the spine can be sometimes hard to get. Uh, we're going to have a few examples. You can have lesions in the spine that are in the vertebral body that replace the whole vertebral body extending into the pedicles here posteriorly. Um, and that will be a little bit easier, but some lesions are are anterior and like this one is anterior you have to go through pedicle and some uh, trabecular bone and look how, how close it is to the aorta uh, it may look dangerous but it's not it's actually a safe biopsy it's just um, doing it safely so the grid again we mark the skin and in this case we are going to access this lesion one of the safest ways which is transpedicularly and if you have a lesion in the vertebral body, you should try to get a window through the pedicle. Remember that when we scan the patient in the CT scan, it's not really uh, parallel to the pedicle. The pedicle has some type, some angulation, but you can always, not always, but most of the time you can find a safe window. And we went here lateral to the pedicle or in the pedicle, but the lateral aspects. And this is the coaxial needle and then the biopsy needle. And we went into the lesion and got a small biopsy we couldn't go much forward because right we don't want to break the cortex and get into the aorta here so the first way to go to the spine is just to try to go perpendicularly in through the pedicle if that is the if you have a window that is the best way to do a biopsy so here we got some part of the lesion and actually this was a patient with metastatic breast cancer so we have here another example of a uh, the, of a lesion in the vertebral body. In this case, the whole vertebral body is in, infected. This is actually a big flag bone and this guy is osteomyelitis. And we were able to go through the pedicle 90, almost 90 degrees perpendicular to the skin, use the coaxial images, which goes all the way to here. And then we did a biopsy of uh, the bone, which was for infection. So in this case also, we found a safe uh, passage to the pedicle and uh, we were able to do that. Remember that in the lumbar spine, the pedicles are bigger, and as you go up to the uh, thoracic spine, it gets smaller, so you, it may not be as easy to find a window, uh, but usually if you do very thin cuts, that's what I do when I go through a pedicle in the spine, I tell the tech to do uh, the, the scout images or the first um, uh, CT scan study to know where I'm going in one millimeter slice thickness, and I usually use the fluoro thickness from anywhere from 1.5 to 2.5 and it's because i mean some of the pedicles can be small and you don't want to miss it it's some, it's a it's a game of uh, millimeters sometimes so another case in the spine and we have this sclerotic lesion here and it's part of the vertebral body and it extends into the right pedicle we have the grid here and the uh, initial images and I bring this image here because even though we have a transpedicular window, it is not completely perpendicular. Like if we take right a line here perpendicular to the skin, uh, it will actually will go uh, through uh, the, uh, the lamina and you may get into the facet and you don't want to get into any of the joints because you may worsen patient's pain or uh, actually create a problem to the patient. Uh, so in this case, uh, we may have to go just a little bit inclined and you have to kind of play the game of how you're going to, how much you're going to angulate. So it doesn't go into the spinal canal and you get into the lesion. But I just want to bring to your attention that even though it's always best to go through the pedicle and safest, there's not always a perpendicular to the skin, a trajectory that you can use uh, because of how the anatomy of the body may be. So in this case, what we ended up doing was going obliquely or uh, just lateral to the pedicle. And, and, and this way we uh, drill through this aspect here of the posterior cortex at the junction between the transverse process and the lamina. And we put the coaxial, we see this blue uh, line here. And then the biopsy needle is the, uh, the, the purple uh, color. And we went right there into the lesion. Uh, and we avoided the facet and also avoided the spinal canal, of course. And but it was not; it went this trajectory. It was not completely perpendicular. But we, I prefer to go through the pedicle even if I can go directly perpendicular to the body. 
So sometimes you can't go through the pedicle for whatever reason. You can't find a safe window or it's been destructed or the patient simply has a soft tissue infection that you don't want to go through, right? Because if you're bouncing for infection, you shouldn't go through an ulcer or through an infected abscess. And we, some of the biopsies we do of the vertebral body are uh, paraspinal. Uh, and uh, we go around uh, the posterior elements. And the problem with this is that obviously here is where the nerve exits and you have to be very careful that you don't transect the nerve. So you have to really, 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 really be kind of right um, below uh, or, or, or say the roof of the neuroforamina and uh, advance the needle very uh, slowly to make sure that that you don't hit the nerve, right? The nerve will exit and go down. So the more lateral do you go, the, the more probability you have of avoiding the, the nerve itself. But you can go as long as it's in the superior aspect or the roof of the neuroforamina. And you most of the time will be safe. I, um, I go very slowly if I have to do it. But you can go anywhere paraspinal. Obviously, when you go to the thoracic spine, there are the ribs and the lungs, and it becomes a little harder. Sometimes you have to drill through a rib. Uh, to get to the vertebral body uh, but you can go paraspinal as well you're going to need a longer needle uh, I, I try to stay away from the retro peritoneum because it can bleed but uh, try to use muscles as the window uh, the rectus spinae and the paraspinal muscles because uh, if it's safer uh, to go through the muscles than just to go through the peritoneal itself especially with these needles that are usually 13 gauge uh, and are big needles uh, considerably uh, for doing percutaneous procedures so uh, just some tips when you're going paraspinal and you cannot, and, and I will do it if you cannot go transpedicularly. Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, some tips for lytic lesions. Some, most of the lesions that um, you're going to get uh, for biopsy either will be lytic or sclerotic. Of course, there's also mixed lesions, which uh, you have to gauge, uh, have an idea of how uh, the, the consistency of the bone itself when you're doing a biopsy, but uh, for the most part, it will be a lytic lesion or a sclerotic lesion. And in this case, we see an MRI, a lytic lesion, there's a large bone cyst, really, really high on T2, multilobulated. And this can cause problems when you're biopsying it because once you hit the lesion, it's all water or blood. And this bone biopsy needles don't get anything out of it because it needs consistency to activate the trapping mechanism. So we're going to uh, discuss a little bit about what do I do uh, to try to get some uh, information to the pathologist. So we have here that lesion and this is the uh, CT that we did and with the grid here and we see this lytic lesion here with the red circle and we are trying to do a biopsy of that but the problem with this lesion is that really inside the lesion when it's lytic there is no bone and like I said before you go with a biopsy needle and you don't get anything back. So the most important thing to remember that is that the best thing that you could do for a bone cyst is to take the interface between the lesion uh, and the bone. So ideally, obviously, you would go this way, right? So you can get this big interface of bone marrow or the trabecular bone and the lesion and, and, and pray that most of it is bone and stays in the bone uh, to do it. Other uh, thing that you can do is just anchor the needle and then take a lot of bone and then you hit the cyst. Uh, I've done a lot of times that I go into the cyst and I aspirate what is inside and I send to the pathologist and they just say it's blood. So it's kind of useless. Uh, and these lesions are really hard to biopsy because most of the time we don't get anything and the pathologist come back and say, well, I just saw some bone dust. I really didn't see anything. And uh, most of the times because even though there's a cyst, the, the bone around it is normal. So it's normal bone and then there's just fluid. And of course, you need to be able to evaluate the border for the pathologist to make a diagnosis. So in this case, we went in and what we did is that I just pretty much went through the cortex and didn't move too much and I held the needle. This was a bone up needle and then I did the biopsy of the interface between the normal bone and the cyst, but when I hit that, when I hit that cystic lesion, the needle just fall, falls through. So that's another thing to keep in mind is that if you're applying a lot of pressure or force with a drill or with a bone needle, 
and suddenly you hit the cyst and you're applying a lot of pressure, it's really going to give away and you have to be careful that it's, it's not giving away uh, to like a very important structure or that it's going to go through, through to a bone and get into the soft tissue. So you have to keep that in mind that once you reach that cystic lesion, uh, you, all that pressure that you put in is going to just really give away and the needle is going to advance very rapidly. So that's what we did in this case, and we were able to biopsy, uh, to diagnose a, a bone cyst, but it's are very hard. And remember, try to take the interface between the bone and the cystic lesion. And aspirating these lesions just really doesn't do anything. If it's an unreasonable bone cyst, you get the fluid. And, uh, and if it's a cyst, you get the blood. And if it's a cyst, you get blood. If it's a lytic lesion, you're going to get necrotic blood too. And it's uh, really hard for the pathologist to make a diagnosis. So the best thing is to take uh, the interface. And you think about it, if it's a lytic destructive lesion, it will have a wide zone of transition. So that transition of bone is usually infiltrated with malignant cells. So we have here another lytic metastasis in MRI. It has a high T2 signal intensity. It has some borders, but some edema around the lesion. And we see here on the T1, that the borders are not really that well defined. They're a little bit of raggy. And uh, you're thinking this is like a metastasis, obviously, and there's some soft tissue extension, and you see the cortex C is really not well defined. It's, it has a primitive pattern in this case. So we did in the biopsy, and what we did is that we first went to this uh, region, and we didn't get anything. There was no consistency to the lesion. It was so lytic. And we didn't get any sample uh, back. I thought because of the MRI, there would be some consistency to the lesion, but there was not. So then we went to the border of the lesion and tried to take the interface between the, the lesion and the bone. Like I said before, in the metastatic lesion, it's a little bit easier because the interface is wider, the zone of transition is wider, and there's a lot of infiltration of malignant cells around the lesion. Uh, it's different from a benign bone cyst that the interface is very, very, very marked and you go from normal bone uh, to a cyst. So always try to find a way to take the border of the lesion. So one last example here, proximal humerus lesion. And here you can see that um, uh, there is a kind of a, a loosened lesion here in the greater tuberosity and proximal humerus. And it, to, to the point, I wanted to get the interface so much that as you can see, the coaxial image, the coaxial needle is actually outside the bone. You have here the cortex of the greater tuberosity, and there is maybe like a few millimeters between the end of the coaxial needle and the cortex, and that's because I, I poke a little hole in the cortex with the diamond tip, and likely I retracted a little bit. And the reason I did that is that I wanted to be able to take the most interface between the bone and the lesion. And that way, once I got to the subcortical bone, I was taking sample, 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 all the way till I got to the lytic lesion. Other thing that you can do, and I've done often, is that I go and take a sample of this uh, part of the bone around the lesion, and then I go through the lesion, and they take a little part of the other side of the bone, so I get as much of the interface between the bone and the lytic, lytic lesion as much as I can. So we talk about the lytic lesion, and now we're going to talk about the sclerotic lesion and tips to biopsy sclerotic lesions, which are very dense and have, uh, they're usually very hard because of all the calcium and, um, and cortical bone. And so in this case, we're going to use an, as an example, this is an osteosteoma, just diffuse thickening of the cortex with a nidus in the center, very classic one, osteosteoma. And in this lesions, the things that big things that we have to remember is first, they're really, really hard to drill. So if you have an uncontrolled needle with the, the battery powered uh, drill, I would use that. And I would get another thing with, with very sclerotic needles is that you should use the shortest needle possible that you're gonna get a good sample. I say that because they're really hard to drill and you, you don't wanna have a lot of needle. Let me try to, you know, if you have a needle going here to the lesion, and then you have outside the patient, you have a long, long needle. Uh, the, the needle kind of wiggles around if it's very long. So it's better to be, to have no, you know, ideally you will have uh, the, the smallest amount of needle outside the patient. So when you drill, it kind of feels more sturdy and you don't have all this wiggling around and uh, of the needle when you're trying to apply a lot of pressure to this sclerotic bone. And the other very important thing is that you never should take 
samples more than one centimeter in a very sclerotic bone because they're really hard to get out of the needle when you're done with the procedure and you're trying to get that needle out of the uh, sorry that sample out of the needle uh, it, may, it takes a lot of effort so the, the bigger the sample the harder it is to get out of the needle uh, so in this case we used the uncontrolled needle and we drilled a lot and made a hole and actually we did the, this is the coaxial uncontrol and this is uh, uh, one of the pros for uh, cryoablation we did a cryoablation of this uh, osteosteoma for treatment as a curative treatment you can either do a cryo or radiofrequency ablation and also when we do a cryoablation or radiofrequency ablation we actually do a biopsy of the lesion no matter what lesion we're going we do a biopsy of the lesion um, uh, put it in formally and send it for surgical pathology and then we do the ablation so we first do a biopsy of that and um, and and then we um, and then and then we do the ablation. So always to remember that. It's just another example of a uh, sclerotic lesion. In this case, this is a paraosteal osteosarcoma, which is the surface osteosarcoma, as the one that looks like a cauliflower. And also we use a bone opti, and we got the coaxial to the beginning of the lesion, and then we drill with the biopsy needle. Again, we don't take more than one centimeter uh, throws just because we want to be able to get that uh, that sample out. So with sclerotic lesions, it's much easier, uh, usually than lytic lesion because the lesion that you get is usually uh, good for sampling and for the pathologies. It's uh, just as long as you know that it's hard, you're going to have to use a lot of force and you should never take a sample larger than one centimeter because I've been in a situation that you get it too, you get you get ambitious and then you get a big sample and then you cannot get it out of the needle. I want to talk a little bit about infection. In infection, most of the time, the bone is very soft, um, but uh, it can be hard. In chronic osteomyelitis, remember in, in chronic osteomyelitis, you develop this involucrum, uh, that is this production of bone around a Brody sepsis and infection. Uh, intraosseous sepsis and that is very sclerotic and hard to biopsy but for the most part infection is uh, the, the bone is very bland and most of the time it's easy to do uh, with a bone opti or a, a human power needle and this case was a fracture that got infected and we went in and this bone was pretty soft and that's what is really important when especially if you're using the drill when you get to the bone uh, start drilling or moving the moving the needle first before you actually push so you can get an idea of a consistency of the bone. It's, you should never drill and push at the same time. Always try to get an idea of the consistency of the bone. And in infection, um, most of the time it will be soft unless it's very, very chronic osteomyelitis and there's just a lot of involucrum and bone production around an intraosseous abscess. So a little bit about bone marrow aspiration, things that you need to remember. This is not a bone marrow aspiration. This is a sacral biopsy and the bone marrow uh, we, we put the patient prone, uh, we use the uncontrolled needle. The uncontrolled needle actually comes in a bone marrow aspiration one that doesn't have a coaxial. It's just the needle itself uh, and it's very useful. And we try to go right there into the uh, posterior iliac bone. And what we do is one of the things that you need to remember for uh, bone marrow aspiration is first, uh, that you need to have the bone marrow aspiration text. So if you're doing a biopsy of this, you need to um, make sure it's planned because the bone marrow aspiration text needs to come and takes the sample for several reasons they 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 kind of judge if the if the sample is is good enough the bone and the aspirate and also some of these patients are in some uh, different protocols and they like i've had patients with uh, experimental protocols of breast cancer that really need a lot of blood samples because uh, their the, the follow-up um, examinations or tests that they do are really comprehensive. So always have the bone marrow aspiration tech with them. The other thing is that for the bone marrow aspiration, you need a CBC 24 hours. Uh, and within 24 hours when uh, doing of doing the procedure. So it's good that if it doesn't have one, you just order one while you're doing it. Uh, so the first thing that you do, you go in, you try to go one centimeter. Now I'm going to do it here in yellow. Pasto cortex, go one centimeter pasto cortex, get the needle right there in the middle of the bone marrow. And if you're not giving sedation to the patient, or even if you're giving sedation to the patient, the first thing you're going to do is you go there with the needle, you take the stylet out, 
And the first thing you're going to do is take a 10cc syringe and you're going to jank that syringe to take spicules because the first, the first pull that you do of blood out of the bone marrow, it needs to have bone spicules. And for, for, you know, for that to happen, you have to actually pull that syringe really hard. And this is the most painful aspect of the procedure. As you know, we put a lot of local anesthesia around the periosteum where we're doing a biopsy because the periosteum is sensitive. And that is, is painful, but the most painful part is when you actually do that pull and you're trying to get those spicules in that first pull. So it's always good to tell the patient that it's gonna be really bothersome, but it's gonna go very fast. Uh, the tech usually needs maybe two to three cc, so it's really a big pull and that's it. Uh, but it's better to do it good because then you show it to the tech and they see if they're spicules or not. And uh, after that, they, they tell you, well, I need, uh, I don't know, five cc's, 10 cc's, I need five, whatever they tell you, you just do the aspiration. But, but once you do the first pull, it's good for you to do it slowly. So the patient doesn't, it doesn't bother the patient that much and it's not that painful. Some techs will ask you to have, to do some of the aspirations in heparinized needles, put a little bit of heparin in the syringe. Uh, some may not, it depends on the protocol. And after the, you do all that, what you do is you just go in two centimeters if the bone is not sclerotic and then you go out and then you give that sample to the tech and that's all you do for a bone marrow aspiration. So um, just keep those things in mind. And the last thing I'm going to discuss is when do I use very small needles and, uh, and, and in my case I use the smallest bone opti needle. I say I call it the one with the green handle. It's kind of an older bone opti needle but it's very small and I feel like I have a lot of control. So there are parts of the body that I don't like to use to drill and I want to have a lot of control and I don't want to go fast. I want to have a lot of uh, um, precision of what I do. And anything in the thoracic, thoracic, thoracic cage, in this case is the sternum. And you see in the sternum, I don't try to go perpendicular like every other biopsy because I don't know how hard the bone is going to be here. So I try to go sideways so in case that you know, I kind of hit a very soft bone and kind of push inadvertently forward. Uh, it kind of try to avoid the aorta. Uh, it's a little bit harder to uh, uh, anchor the bone, the needle in the bone when you're kind of sideways, but for me it's safer. Also when I do rib biopsies, I try to, you have, I try to anchor in the bone kind of sideways in terms of perpendicular. I feel like it's safer for me and after doing this for many years, I feel like it's something I can do uh, and it's just not really that hard. So in this, this region like this in the chest wall, I usually use the bone opti. I feel like I have more control in how much I advance. It may not be true, it's just the way I feel. And, and also the needle is much smaller. These are all the two examples that I would use the small bone opti needle. I, we do some metatarsal heads and, and bones for infection. Uh, again, controversial, but we sometimes do it. And it's such a small bone, so we uh, use a very small needle. And in this case, I use uh, the small bone opti. These bones in infection are really soft, and if you're not careful and you push for, I mean, you go through several bones at the same time, so you have to be very careful. And this is a very uh, expansolytic lesion within the acromion, and it almost feels like you know you're gonna fracture all this if you kind of push too hard. So we went with the bone opti and, and biopsy this lesion. Uh, to have a little bit more control and you know, kind of didn't want to fracture. So smaller bones in the hands, foot, and the chest wall, I try to use a smaller needle. I like the bone opti, I feel like, uh, because almost like the fine tuning of, 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 of like turning a knob, you have more precision and that's what I do and that's what I use. Of course, it's not the only needle you can use, but it's the one uh, that I try to use for that reason. Thank you so much and I hope that this uh, presentation helps you. Uh, when you go to the MSK or IR rotation and you're facing uh, to do bone biopsies to have an idea of what things you need to do and of course what things you should not do. Thank you.